Yes, this is a uh, a problem, I think, largely because of the association that people make when they hear the term slavery with modern slavery, uh, slavery in the American South. I have behind me Abraham Lincoln here, uh, who was one who uh, helped to emancipate uh, slaves from uh, from the tyranny of this horrible system in the southern United States. And a lot of people, they read slavery or they read slave in the Bible and they think, oh, it's, it's the antebellum uh, South in America or uh, in, the, the, um, in, in the colonial era. This is a, a radical difference. Uh, you have the, what you see going on in the scriptures is actually more like indentured servitude. And I'll get to Leviticus uh, 25 in a minute. But basically, if the law of Moses were being followed, then the horrors of the, you know, under the, under, uh, you know, under antebellum slavery uh, would have not been an issue. Uh, For example, kidnapping was prohibited uh, in the law of Moses, that it was punishable by death. That's how slavery got started in the modern era. Secondly, if you injured your servant, uh, your servant could be, would be set free without debt. Uh, and but again, in under the technically under the laws of the South, a master could pretty much do whatever he wanted without fearing any sort of legal uh, legal challenges uh, for murder. If a if a an employer you know, master in the Bible uh, struck his servant so that he died, then the master. I think employer is something more like it. Someone who's um, hired him on, under contract. Uh, that person would be, you know, could be you know, capitally punished, which tells you that the servant in Israel was not someone who is mere property, but actually had rights, um, but was certainly was under a contract that need, that was to be fulfilled. Also, uh, another difference is that this was a, a six-year contract, and the seventh year the servant would go free, as opposed to a lifetime of servitude. Also, in the South, uh, in in the United States, what happened was you purchased slaves. They were yours. They were often branded uh, uh, with, and and that was a a life lifelong uh, acquisition, as opposed to a contract, uh, which is six years and couldn't go on unless you wanted to stay in that home of your employer, uh, you know, master. Uh, so you could in, go on for a long time, but the contract had to be honored. And the prophets, like Amos and Jeremiah, they are uh, they chastise the people of Israel for holding on to servants longer than the contract, uh, you know, the maximum contract uh, permitted. Uh, and so, so it was a rebuke to them that they were violating the law, violating their these rights, and so forth. So understand what is going on with the with southern with. You know, with biblical servitude, uh, it is a far cry from what we see going on in the uh, in the United States and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, but we also need to remember too that if a slave ran away from a foreign land, God says that the runaway slave was to be able to settle in any of Israel's cities. Uh, other cultures surrounding Israel had extradition treaties in which if a slave ran away to your country, you were to send him back to the owner in the other country. Mm-hmm. And But God says, no, let that runaway slave who's running away from harsh circumstances, no doubt, could settle within Israel as a place of refuge, as a haven uh, for, uh, you know, that, and, and so this was, so you see over and over again that there is a very strong affirmation of, and, and protection of the vulnerable. We see re- the repetition of the alien, the widow, and the orphan; these were to be protected. And when we get to, and and also keep in mind that it was poverty that put people into servitude in Israel. It wasn't because they wanted to, that they uh, were just property bought and sold and so forth. No, it was when things got desperate that they would finally contract themselves out to work for someone, and they would get food, drink, uh, clothing, shelter. Uh, and work to do, and then they would pay off the debt um, that was re- that was you know for, within those six years. 
Mm. So, so it is a very humane sort of thing. It was indentured servitude that we're talking about here. But when it comes to the Leviticus 25 passage, what about foreigners whom you may acquire? Well, even that term acquire, well, how do people acquire servants? Well, sometimes through warfare, sometimes people migrate uh, and so on. But we need to keep in mind, too, just a few chapters earlier in Leviticus 19, it says that the Israelites are to care for and love the alien in their midst. So, yes, you can have aliens working for you, uh, sojourners working for you. But it also goes on, you know, and term, even the term acquire is used of God's acquiring the people of Israel uh, out of Egypt in Exodus 15 in the Song of Moses, that you have purchased, you know, the people you have redeemed or purchased or acquired. And also the Israelite, obviously not a piece of property, we're told that the foreigner who is living in the land can actually become a person of means. So those many of those people who are living uh, as servants in Israel, and again, since they don't have can't own land themselves, the natural thing is just to continue on within a household, that they are continuing on uh, perpetually within a certain household in a tribal land. But the foreigner could not own land. But it says that you could still become a person of beans in Israel. So it goes on in verses you know, 47 in, in chapter 25 to talk about if, a, if a sojourner, an alien or a sojourner among you uh, becomes a person of means, that person can, you know, can acquire uh, an Israelite. Uh, and so you know, to work for him, so is the Israelite who has been acquired, just like the foreigner who has been acquired, uh, is that just a piece of property? No, not at all. It's just using this legal contractual language uh, without saying that this, this we're just dealing with property here. Uh, in fact, the aliens in the land of Egypt, they are to find rest. In fact, God says that the law is to be for both the alien as well as the Israelite, for the stranger in your midst as well as for the uh, for the native. So they were to, both to operate under the same law. So you see this fundamentally humane impulse. And God reminds the Israelites over you know, nearly 35 times that you were once foreigners or aliens in the land of Egypt. Therefore, you are to care for the alien in your midst. So, so some people will say, look, this basically overturns all of those things. No, I think if you properly understand it, you see that, yes, Foreigners can be acquired to work for you and to live in your house. In fact, they would be like part of the family. Uh, and so they were to. So it wasn't as though there was this hostility, uh, but rather we need to understand that there was to be a, a general concern for them. But even though in the ancient Near East people during famines could come and live in another land or uh, warfare, uh, there'd be war captives and they would you know, could, could live in a certain home and so forth. So the, there were different ways to acquire. It wasn't as though there was some sort of slave trade going on. That certainly wasn't the case. Uh, there wasn't kidnapping going on like there was in the colonial period. So those are a few you know, significant differences to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, I'm reminded of what you said at the beginning that, you know, Old Testament legislation seems to be very realistic or taking into consideration the human condition. And, you know, in, in Deuteronomy 15, it does say, well, and, and as you mentioned, you know, people sold themselves because poverty struck. And Deuteronomy 15 says, well, you know, if you obeyed my laws, then there won't be any poor person in the land anyway. So there, there, there's, there is this tension between, well, God's ideal, but his knowledge of the fact that fallen humanity will simply not be able to live up to it. Right, right. True. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Well, it probably would have been as helpful as saying, down with the Roman Empire, bring the Roman <laughs> Empire to an end. Uh, uh, what you have is actually a far more effective way of attacking the problem. Uh, it, it's sort of like you know, when, you, when you look at, say, Saudi Arabia, where women have a much more difficult time, like getting driver's licenses, being able to drive and so on. Uh, if, if, say, someone becomes a believer and says in Saudi Arabia and says, hey, I'm a woman, I ought to be able to have all of these rights because I'm a Christian, we are f fully equal to men and so forth, which is true. Uh, but if you try to overhaul everything suddenly uh, without maybe thinking in terms of incrementally or even thinking about how the gospel witness is going to be affected, 
uh, people saying, "Oh, I don't want to. I don't. I don't like Christianity. Look at my my. Look at what my wife is doing and how she's she's asserting all of her rights and saying she ha- should be able to do this and that and and so forth." Um, it could be. It could backfire. What Paul and Peter do is much more, I think, effective in one. Paul saying that if you are able to gain your freedom, to do so. Secondly, he reminds all the you know he reminds slaves that they are equal to their masters, that in Christ there is no male or female, slave or free, that all are one in Christ. Also, the way that Paul treats slaves, if you look at uh, Romans 16, Paul mentions two slaves who are his Mm. fellow workers. Uh, One is is Urbanus and the other is uh, Andronicus. These are common slave names in ancient Rome. But yet these are fellow workers of Paul, so they share in ministry. These, these are fundamentally equal in, uh, in, the, in the kingdom of God. And Paul says in Romans 16, 16, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss, which is a picture of family belonging, that slaves belonged to uh, the rest of the community as fundamentally equal. Uh, so it was a picture of family affection, of belonging. And even the Lord's Supper was a picture of belonging, that master and slave sat together at the same table. This was a very subversive activity. Uh, yeah, they're not saying bring down the empire, but they're actually doing so. They're they're actually subverting the social structures through their own Christian practices by sharing in the Lord's Supper together, eating as family, uh, rather than slave eating over there and master eating over here. No, it was all uh, a communion. Uh, so the, there are some things that ought to be understood, and uh, and even I'd say in in the book of Revelation where uh, where the the city of Babylon is being condemned against quoting the Old Testament, where it refers to the city of Tyre, which had been uh, treating treating human beings as cargo. Sounds like the slave trade, doesn't it? Uh, that they're basically just treating them as 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 as, as chattel, as as property, and uh, and so forth. And this is being condemned. That Babylon is being brought down because of how it has treated human beings in this slave system. So again, you do see indicators of this. You do even see kidnapping condemned in in, in First Timothy chapter one. Paul is condemning kidnappers as violators of God's law and so on. So there are a number of different things that should be said, and we can even point to Jesus who said that he came to set prisoners free. He came to bring uh, relief to those who have been oppressed and so forth. Well, uh, that was a message for the slaves in ancient Rome. Uh, Jesus came to set them free, to, to liberate them from, uh, from bondage. And, 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 this, and, and Jesus denounced anything that would dehumanize uh, human beings. He spoke out against those sorts of things that diminished uh, the, the, you know, the humanity of someone else. So those are t- the types of things that we need to keep in mind, that broader picture. And rather than focusing on, oh, why did Paul speak out? You'd say, well, look at how Paul was subverting the Roman Empire and its yeah. slave system. 